To close the gap between women's health research and other scientific disciplines, Ward and Mary Wallstrom of Harbor Springs have made a $1 million gift to bolster education and research in the MSU College of Human Medicine's Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology. I'm uh, Dr. Rick Leach. I'm chair for the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Biology at Michigan State University. And so women's health research was something that was envisioned 15 years ago when we first came with the um, advancement of our, our college to uh, Grand Rapids. And we really visioned then uh, that we really wanted to make sure that we were uh, investigating very important clinical uh, problems, health problems of women. A and so we wanted to make sure that we looked across the life course of a woman's life, starting from adolescent to old age. And at the same time, we wanted to make sure that even then, uh, we were very concerned about health equity. Mm. And, and so our research is really focused in three major areas, and that is uh, maternal and infant health and their outcomes, uh, benign uh, gynecological diseases, uh, including endometriosis and, and fibroid uh, uteri and uh, other uh, issues with uh, reproduction and, uh, and, and pelvic health. And then lastly, uh, gynecologic cancers. And so those three areas really m cover uh, th this wide breadth of a woman's life course, again, from early uh, adulthood to, to uh, uh, a later uh, period in life when cancer has increased. And, and so based on that, roadmap, uh, we went out and actually started recruiting uh, leading investigators from around the country to be able to fill in uh, each of those needed areas of research. And really, uh, tremendous support from uh, Dean Rapley uh, and, and Dean uh, Beauchamp and uh, Dean Souza, but also from the leader, senior leadership within the university that really allowed us to attract these individuals for them to really uh, support in terms of startup packages and uh, other resources in order for them to be successful. And as a result, uh, we've really uh, been able to advance our reputation, uh, not only in terms of the research that's being done and published in manuscripts and presentations around the world, uh, but also to uh, acquire and, and and, and compete for uh, leading research uh, funding from around the country. So as a result of you know, all the research that has been done over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, it really is a culmination of uh, multiple uh, faculty. Uh, as I said, you know, today we have uh, almost 23 faculty, research faculty in the department. Uh, and their dedicated work, in not only in terms of publications, uh, presenting this research across the globe, has enabled us now to be very uh, competitive uh, and accomplished researchers uh, that has enabled us to uh, be awarded these national uh, grants and, and really, NIH funding is a recognition which is very stringent um, of the, the quality of the work in which you can be then uh, uh, funded for that research. And as a result, uh, this last year, we were uh, recognized as the number one ranked uh, uh, Department of OBGYN in the country for NIH funding. It really is a, a a result of very dedicated and hard work from our researchers at Henry Ford uh, in Detroit and our departmental researchers in Grand Rapids and East Lansing. But again, it's this uh, uh, accomplishment that would otherwise not be possible without the support uh, and generosity of our uh, both college and university leaders. Tell me a little bit about the Wallstroms 
what will their gift allow you to even become even better? Ward and, and, and Mary Margaret Wallstrom, um, if you uh, just sit and talk to them, are just a delightful couple. Uh, they have a tremendous family, and they are really a legacy uh, in Spartan um, a tradition. You know, they're, they're just uh, uh, this legacy of uh, their family being Spartan supporters dates back uh, even to uh, Ward's uh, father. After sitting with them and talking and, and, and going over what they thought were their interests, uh, it was clear that they were pretty clever in understanding uh, that we at MSU and our department could actually uh, support and take forward their concerns. And so based on that uh, and talking uh, with Dr. Stacy Mismer and Dr. Ron, Ch Ron Chandler, who were um, really instrumental in, in, in moving this interest, this relationship that we had with the Wallstroms forward, uh, we were able to really identify some areas of interest and areas of need. And one of the things that is really critical in advancing clinical translational research is engaging investigators early on in their career. Uh, many times it's, it's difficult in, you know, in, in medical school or in graduate school uh, to be able to really have an uh, uh, identified period of time uh, with the financial support in order to do this work. And, you know, Ward and, and Mary Margaret picked up on this, mm -hmm. and they picked up on it uh, in, in a way that was uh, uh, very insightful. And so based on uh, that need, uh, you know, one of the areas that we're going to be focusing on with this very generous gift they were able to provide us is to actually uh, identify individuals in their early career, whether medical school or graduate school, and be able to uh, support them in this area. You know, we're able to uh, really identify uh, those uh, students uh, in, in medical school or in graduate school uh, that themselves have this passion uh, for women's health research. And to be able to really protect them uh, in this year period of time so that they can really focus in that area. Uh, you know, it really uh, bark harkens back to, you know, when I was uh, uh, finishing medical school and, you know, presenting research uh, at one of our departmental meetings. And I had an individual researcher after the meeting uh, give me a note and in that note was, you know, uh, Dr. Leach, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, but if you really want to sink your teeth into something, please contact me. And it was that mentorship relationship that really uh, enabled me uh, to continue in a protected research environment to go on and become uh, a worker or uh, a funded researcher for NIH and then continue on with uh, R01 funding from NIH. Mm -hmm. So it's those uh, relationships, it's those um, uh, sparks that ignite uh, these young investigators to become successful in a focused area. And we're really indebted to, uh, again, uh, Ward and, and, and Mary Margaret for their recognizing that and identifying an opportunity for them to support that opportunity. So, you know, the, the commitment from the university, from the college, uh, for our research uh, journey uh, in recruiting those uh, individuals from across the country, and, and in fact, from around the world, uh, really did, in fact, uh, proved to be successful. And it was that vision uh, and support from our leadership that enabled us to be uh, ranked uh, number one in the country for uh, uh, departments of OBGYN. But I must add that it's that ranking uh, from last year that was really a culmination of really this relationship, partnership that uh, 
Henry Ford and MSU have uh, have started. Uh, it, it really was the uh, the researchers uh, from uh, Henry Ford, who are faculty in our department here, uh, and our faculty uh, across our other campuses that enable us to do that. In fact, uh, Dr. Christine Johnson, who is the chair of public health uh, sciences at uh, Henry Ford, is the number one NIH ranked OBGYN uh, researcher in the country. So it is that uh, partnership, it is that collaboration that we are uh, growing, that we are trying to um, uh, blossom into, you know, continuing that, uh, that work. The Wallstrom Family Endowed Women's Health Research Fund is creating an early career training program to increase the number of scientists and clinicians pursuing a lifelong career focused on women's health care and research. The program pairs medical and graduate students with research teams and will support independent research projects. Four College of Human Medicine early career graduate students, including one third-year medical student, were recently selected and awarded the endowed funds. Each will utilize the philanthropic funds to push forward current research projects, which would not have been otherwise possible. My name is Roxalana Sudik. I go by Roxy. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I've been interested in medicine since growing up. Um, but I think the most influential experience was that of being a patient myself. Um, I'm 24 years old. I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 23, and I had my excision surgery four months ago. I started experiencing symptoms when I was 16, though. Although I called my mom the other day, and she said it was 14, so <laughs> maybe it was 14. All that to say, I didn't really understand what was going on. And for the most part, I thought that it was normal. I thought that every woman was experiencing the pain, the nausea, as much as I was. And it wasn't until I was an undergrad. And at this point, I was interested in medicine, but I was majoring in neuroscience, psychology. I wanted to go into neurology, possibly neurosurgery. Um, and my symptoms just started getting worse. And I took a gender and health class just for fun. And as I was sitting in that class is when I heard the word endometriosis for the first time. And I was diligently taking notes like every pre-med student does. <laughs> and as I'm writing these things down, I'm realizing that that's me, that like those are the symptoms that I've been having. And this is not the normal experience. I turned to my friend and I asked her, like, don't you? go through this? And she was like, no. <laughs> um, and so that's really when it hit that, I mean, there's a lot of things at play with women's health. Talking about health in general is very stigmatizing, but when it comes to reproductive health, it is particularly taboo. And so not having had conversations about it with family and friends, I didn't realize that it was not normal to experience pain, that pain was not part of growing up as a woman. That class changed everything for me. I've read a lot of books about people experiencing chronic conditions and disability, just trying to find myself in those books. One of the things that I remember reading a lot um, is people describing their experience with that condition or disability as part of their experience, that it's not who they are as a whole. And I think that is very empowering to take back your story, to rewrite it, but it's also something that I've never really connected with because for me, endometriosis is the whole of me. It's changed the way that I see the world, the way that I relate to people, family, friends, um, and hopefully it changes the way that I connect with and care for my patients. You can really see that they are passionate about women's health care, um, and they are passionate about the people within the realm, um, and especially Shannon and I, um, young investigators, as well as young investigators who aren't in the room right now. <laughs> they came in, and they really opened up about their experiences with women's health. 
So, I mean, they shared their own personal experiences um, and loved ones in their lives um, who have been experiencing the realm of women's health care. Um, and that really enabled myself to open up to them about my own experiences. I think meeting with them, it felt far less formal and more of connecting emotionally, mentally. It was like a mind-to-mind sort of situation. So it was really beautiful to see that passion. I think what also struck me was their interest in the science of it all. Um, We did a tour of the Grand Rapids Research Center, and they were very invested. They were asking great questions, and that's that's always wonderful to see um, people who do want to support the cause actually getting involved and and asking questions themselves. So that was that was quite phenomenal. My name's Shannon Harkins. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student um, in Ron Chandler's lab in Grand Rapids um, in the OB Gyn department. I, I've always known I wanted to do a PhD, um, and although my path to the PhD hasn't been quite linear, you know, I, I did my bachelor's de- degree abroad in the United Kingdom and my master's degree in Germany, um, and I worked at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute um, and the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston for three years before starting my PhD. Um, I knew I wanted to continue the research at the level I had been performing, um, and I knew that there were a lot of things that I wanted to learn. And uh, one of the realms that I, I've had some research experience in was women's health. Um, I previously worked in um, breast cancer. Um, but that being said, I actually knew very little, if I'm being honest, about gynecologic malignancies. And knowing what I do now, knowing that you know endometrial cancer, um, the rates, sorry, the rates of endometrial cancer um, incidents, as well as the mortality, are continuing to rise each year. That they represent a significant health disparity, with Black women being more likely to um, be diagnosed with advanced disease and more likely to die from the disease, um, and also not completely understanding why the rates are increasing. You know, originally it was attributed to the obesity epidemic, but Other types of endometrial cancer are not associated with obesity, and we're still seeing an increase um, in these um, aggressive cancers. Um, And so I was drawn to um, Ron's lab um, because I wanted to pursue, um, you know, research in, you know, endometrial cancer, the gynecologic malignancies, and to learn more about, um, you know, something that, like I said, I, I knew very little about initially, but also I think in general, um, when I'm coming from previously hematological malignancies, when I compare the two, it's night and day what's known. You know, hem- hematology has had the cover of what, like Life magazine with a matinib and all of these personalized cancer treatments. But, you know, the the endometrium itself is a, a very complex um, environment. It's always cycling. It is a literal and physical human target in the sense that you've got to, you know, it's, it's always moving, it's always cycling. And between everything going on inside of that, you also have to understand, you know, molecularly, you know, what's happening. You know, my PhD is in um, genetics and genome sciences. So, you know, there's somatic mutations that happen, um, different um, lifestyle factors, you know, all of these things that are contributing to the development of endometrial cancer. Um, and so for, for my project, I'm actually studying the role of a gene, um, which is called CHD4, um, in endometrial cancer. Um, it's a chromatin remodeling gene. So before um, I, I bore people to tears talking about the, the intricacies of genetics, I like to think about it like a, a recipe, right? Like, so, um, you know, the genes are the recipe. It tells you how to make the protein, or in our case, we'll talk about a cake, um, people like cake. Um, So, you know, you've got this recipe. And so you can have mutations in the gene. So that would be maybe something inconsequential, like switching from, you know, um, a half cup of sugar to a fourth cup. Maybe we're we're trying to cut out artificial sugar or like, you know, added sugar or something. You know, some of them could be polymorphisms like that, where it's not going to be a huge change, but you can also have something, a gene uh, mutation that's going to be more you know, impactful. We're going to switch that sugar with salt. You're going to notice the difference. Um, in the case of CHD4, it's a chromatin remodeling gene. So it's not just the instructions, it's our ability to read them. So a chromatin remodeling gene, um, CHD4, works with a bunch of gene friends or protein friends, if you will, um, in the nerd complex. Um, 
endearing. We love the name. It's true. It's relatable, you know, um, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, it works together to repress gene transcription so that the protein isn't made. So in the recipe analogy, I'd say it's something along the lines of gluing the page together. So we're not making cake because as far as if you're flipping through the pages of the book, it's not there. And so if that protein is essential in preventing cancer, something like a tumor suppressor gene, you know, it's, it's stopping the cell from over-proliferating and leading to cancer, then that's a problem if, if we lose it, if we lose expression of that. Or in some cases, we'll have the opposite where, you know, it basically doesn't allow us to turn the page and we're stuck. And, you know, people like cake, but I think you and I can both agree if I had cake every single day, I'd be pretty sick. So, you know, and that's all I can make. So I think, um, you know, people think of genes and this and, you know, it can get quite complicated. But really, at the end of the day, it's that recipe there and your ability to read it. So what we say, like chromatin accessibility and CHD4 plays a big part in that. Um, and it's the most frequently mutated um, chromatin remodeling mutation in uterine serous carcinoma, which is a particularly particularly aggressive um, type of uterine cancer. Um, it only makes up about 10% of cases, but it's responsible for 40% of endometrial cancer-related deaths. And a lot of that is due to um, early metastasis, um, or it's hypothesized to be because of early metastasis, um, with the majority of patients being diagnosed in late-stage disease. And you know, a lot of that, um, there's a number of reasons for that, but um, essentially it, it leads to, to worse outcomes when compared to the most common type, which is called uterine endometrioid carcinoma, um, in which um, patients typically do quite well, and it's a lower risk for metastasis and spread. So I think, um, you know, for me as a cancer researcher, you know, working in women's health, I think there's there's a lot of room for improvement. I mean, we're already starting behind, right? If I think of something with, we, we talked about this earlier, but we, we uh, what was it, 1986, that they recommended that we consider including women in trials. And then 1993, they were like, no, 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 like, let's up the ante. We're going to make it, it's it's required to have women and minorities in, in clinical trial studies. And so I think if you're comparing something like a disease that affects men and women or a disease that even affects men alone, like prostate cancer. I think what they've done with Movember, I love it. I love, you know, having these conversations. And I think that we're so behind on that for endometrial cancer. It's, you know, I've talked to my mom and, you know, it's most common in postmenopausal women and somehow it wasn't on her radar. And it's, it's, it's baffling to me. And it's, you know, it's not because my mom is, is a, you know, living in the clouds somewhere, just, you know, blissfully ignorant. It's, it's right. the fact that it's not out there. They, you know, a lot of women even think, I've had a lot of women tell me that they thought, you know, a pap smear could test for endometrial cancer. And, you know, occasionally I've seen that maybe if it's, it's, if it's a really advanced disease, you might be able to pick up something, but that's not what it's for. It's for cervical cancer. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people, I think the awareness needs to be there. I think the funding needs to be there. It's historically underfunded. Um, and I think that it's, it's going to take time and we need more models. So, you know, I'm working on these mouse models so we can get a better understanding of what the genes that are, are known to be mutated or lost um, in this cancer are. We need to, you know, more models to be able to understand what these genes are doing. You know, historically, um, mouse models, you know, that's how we know what anything does. We knocked it out and, you know, if, if it did something, then, you know, we wrote it down on a clipboard and we went on from there. And now we're able to knock it out, not just in the entire mouse. Um, you know, for example, CHD4, if you knock it out a mouse, it's lethal. So it, it, it's not going to, we're not going to learn anything other than that it's important, right? You know, and, and, and that's helpful, but not when we're thinking in the context of disease, right? Because it's, it's, it's there. So I think, um, you know, now we can target the mutation specifically to the endometrial epithelium. So in the case of a carcinoma, those are the cells believed to be the cell of origin. Um, and so we can, we can, target these mutations to specific cells, and then see what's happening, um, you know, how the, there's a change in the structure of the, the tissue itself, but also, you know, genetic mutations and other changes, you know, anywhere in that recipe, you know, from the instructions to the actual cake. We're able to check every level, and we can see what's happening, so... So I first actually met the Wallstroms um, working in the lab, so it was a... It was a Friday night. It was about 7 p.m. And, um, you know, there is nowhere else in the world that a Ph.D. student would rather be. I think we all know that. It's factual. Um, 
Um, but that being said, I was working, you know, it'd been a, it'd been a long week and, you know, for me, Friday is the day that I determine, uh, whether, you know, anything has to carry on to the weekend. So Friday is game day, you know, like I am going for it. And, uh, that particular day, it was a, it was a, it was a busy day. And I saw, um, Dr. Mismer come in, um, with, um, two people, um, that I, I didn't necessarily know. Um, but, um, one of them had asked, you know, are you a student? And I, I was like, of course, yes, yes, I'm a PhD student. I'm in Ron Chandler's lab, I'm, you know, in the OB-GYN department. And, um, you know, we got talking and, and uh, they had questions. They were curious. They, it, it seems that they might have been going through the department to look for a student. So they, they caught me in the wild, which we love to see. Um, but, you know, it was it was it was it was wonderful. So uh, what I thought was going to be a two second, you know, check in conversation turned to conversations about my science, about research, about, you know, anything and everything in between. And I, I honestly think that um, the Wallstroms are natural scientists. I think I I know that Mr. Wallstrom, um, I know he's an engineer, um, but he's he's also um, I think there's a there's a blurred line at some point right between engineer and scientist. And I would say he's he's definitely both. Um, and of course, Mrs. Wallstrom as well. You know, they're curious. Their questions. It, it everything followed through. We were able to go back and forth. And you know, and I think as well, they were surprised how little they they even knew about endometrial cancer. It wasn't on their radar necessarily. Um, and they were, but they were interested. You know, it was it was a, a real conversation, a meeting of minds. You know, discussing. And so I think their their natural curiosity shows and their passion for science and women's health um, really shines through. And I think that, you know, the gift, um, the generous gift that they've, they've given to us um, is just a testament to their vision that they're investing in, you know, young investigators to, you know, help enhance, you know, my PhD education um, and Roxy's medical education um, to make us better in every step of our career for the future. They're preparing us, you know, I think um, for me as a PhD student to, to be able to, you know, design and execute a part of or a dream that I've had for my project for quite some time, uh, it, it allows me to, you know, I, we all have sort of ideas and things that we've thought of for our project and to be able to do that um, because of of this generous gift, it's it's a it's going to be a humongous um, game changer for my project. It's gonna it's gonna drastically improve my ability to be able to um, monitor my mice. I don't know if I, I mentioned what my my grant was uh, based upon. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I study these mouse models. Um, CHD4 is my main one. I've got some other genes as well that I'm I'm um, looking into. Um, but essentially, one piece um, of this puzzle is we know from patient data. Um, what it, what um, mutations are occurring in these tumors. But once again, we don't know what the sort of functional implications of those mutations are. And so we're trying these different models, but, you know, some of them are winners and, and some of them, you know, you just never know, right? You don't know what's going to happen. That's, that's why we do the research, because we need to know what these genes are doing in the normal endometrium as well as in the malignant endometrium. And so I actually asked for um, an ultrasound um, machine to be able to monitor um, the, the uterus and, you know, to some degree, obviously, the endometrium um, to be able to see what is happening in these models. Because I'm, as somebody that absolutely loves animals, I think it's, it's important that the mice are, are cared for by people that love animals. Um, but also, you know, there's this three R's of animal research um, reduction, refinement, replacement. And so by doing ultrasound, I'm able to at least satisfy two of those. I'm able to reduce the number of mice I need because I'm able to collect more data from each mouse. And that's also refining my methods and use of these mice so that, you know, I'm able to know. So not only am I just going to get a tumor from a mouse eventually, but I'm able to check the growth kinetics. How quickly is it growing? Is this an aggressive disease? Is this something like uterine serous carcinoma? Or is it behaving, you know, more like a uterine endometrioid carcinoma? On top of that, you know, I never have to take down um, another mouse that maybe doesn't have a tumor. Sometimes you think it has a tumor, but it's, you know, it's got an ovarian cyst for some reason. You know, there are things that happen. And so I know exactly what I'm going to be dealing with. I don't have to, you know, there are limits to how large a tumor, for example, can get. And, 
you know, with the ultrasound, I never have to worry that it's too large or that the animal's suffering, you know, um, or if it gets too large, obviously the cells inside can become necrotic as well. And that's not usable material for me. So I'm able to optimize my experiment to make my mice the happiest because it is scientifically known that happy mice make for better science. There was a science paper on this. I'm not even kidding. Um, but also that I'm able to, you know, test more models, test more genes. So it also allows us to be able to screen for more so that we can test. Because once we understand what these genes are doing um, and how a mutation in those you know, impacts the, the spread of cancer, you know, is it a metastasis suppressor gene? Is it stopping the cells from spreading? Is it a tumor suppressor gene? Is it preventing tumors from forming? You know, where in the malignant process is it affecting? Then we can translate that into you know, the human um, into, you know, something that will help essentially um, better um, treat either obviously gynecologic malignancies, endometrial cancer, but also to know what to target. If we know, you know, there are, in the case of my recipe book examples, there are drugs available that work with chromatin remodelers where we could cut the page open and we can read the gene again. We just have to know what we're doing. One of the reasons that I chose to come to Michigan State University was the focus on women's health care. I think even before the Blue Ridge rankings came out this year, a few years ago, Michigan State was ranking um, very high nationally for funding, and they were one of the few medical schools that were doing research beyond just infertility. And as important infertility as it is, women's health care is much broader than that. It stems throughout the entire life course. Another interest was equity, which I found that was something that was ingrained not just in the research world at the College of Human Medicine, it was ingrained in the curriculum. So this passion for equity and women's health care, it really culminated in the research project that I'm working on right now. With the support from the Wallstroms, I'll be continuing it into the summer. So it stems from my experiences with chronic pain, but my experiences are not alone. 20.9% of the U.S. population experiences chronic pain, and the majority of those people experiencing chronic pain are women. And as we think about pregnancy, a lot of times that pain does not diminish. Instead, it ramps up a little bit. So when we're thinking about the treatment of that pain, we have very few options. The most highly recommended treatment is acetaminophen, over-the-counter Tylenol. The estimates show that 40 to 70 percent of women use acetaminophen in their pregnancy as compared to 2 to 15 percent of women who use NSAIDs in their pregnancy. And that's because we do have well-documented challenges with NSAID use in pregnancy. It can impact um, the fetus as it's developing in utero. But we've really only recently started to understand the mechanism of action of acetaminophen. And with that understanding, there came an international report. It was a culmination of scientists, researchers across the world who started calling the alarm that we don't really understand the impact that acetaminophen may have in utero. So there have been quite a few studies that have suggested that acetaminophen may be able to cross into the placenta, that its mechanism of action includes acting on um, serotonergic receptors, cannabinoid receptors, all of which are important in the development of the brain as well as other organs in the fetus. And so these studies have been observational in nature. I think that those are very powerful, but they have been retrospective, right? So we're asking women and their families to recall their use of acetaminophen, and recall, as we know, is not the most sound research that there is. There have also been animal studies, which have been just phenomenal, but it is at times difficult to generalize what we find in animals to humans. So the research that we're working on over the summer is using a data set of over 10,000 women across the United States, so it is very diverse. We're looking at women who have chronic pain and disability as compared to women who do not. 
and we're looking at use of acetaminophen as well as going through their interviews um, as well as their lab data including specimens from their placenta to understand the timing, the dose, the frequency of the acetaminophen use and then looking at short-term birth outcomes. The goal of this is to better inform our understanding of acetaminophen use in populations that are usually underfunded, understudies, populations of women with chronic pain and disability in order to better have shared decision-making between themselves and their physicians so that in those rooms together, they can make decisions that are the best for their health. To be quite honest, I don't think that I would be able to take on this research at all over the summer without the funding. I love research. It's something that I've been engaged in for six, seven years now, but it really comes down to funding. Without that funding, it's it's very challenging to be able to support yourself, to have that protected space, to, to dive deep into the questions that you're curious about. I do want to mention I'm working on it with two other medical students, Kamal Safa and John Garber, and under the mentorship of Dr. Omaima Al-Sharawi at the Department of Family Medicine and Dr. Christian Mega at the Department of OBGYN and Reproductive Biology. So without them, this project wouldn't exist, but without the Wallstroms, we would not be able to push it forward. The ultimate goal of our research is to have that better understanding. I'm really interested in OBGYN as a career. I'm a member of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so ideally we would love to present this at the National Clinical and Scientific Meeting, as well as publish a manuscript, right? There's no good in having this knowledge if you're not disseminating it. So really grateful for these opportunities and also for this opportunity, right? Science is not just restricted to the academic world. It's something that exists day to day. Medicine is woven into day to day lives and being able to talk about it, to share it with a broad audience. I mean, I think that it is powerful and it can change lives. We've been discussing the Wallstrom Family Endowed Women's Health Research Fund at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. For more, visit humanmedicine.msu.edu. I'm Russ White for MSU Today.